Hello, everybody. This is Carrie, and we are back with another episode of Unleashed. Uh, I today am with my friend Amber. I met Amber at this cool event I always talk about called Thrive. By this point, it probably sounds like a cult, but it's really not. Um, Amber has a really unusual story, I think. She was very driven in school, um, grade school, essentially, and then she got to college. Something happened, she lost her motivation and direction, and it took her nine years to finish her BA. But now, she got herself back on track and uh, owns her own law firm. She practices uh, criminal defense and immigration law, and she also has just launched a podcast called More Than Corporate. So we're gonna talk about what's going on with Amber. Amber, thanks for being here today. Of course. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Absolutely. I'm glad we connected and we could make this happen. Yeah, for sure. So, so tell us a little bit about your early school journey. I know just a moment ago, you said you came out of the womb ready to go to college. Yeah. I mean, it was, I, I can't remember a time in my life where college wasn't in the plans. It just, I don't, I don't really remember my family pushing it on me and I don't remember it being like that big of a conversation. It was just something I always knew was the direction that I wanted to go. I grew up in a super, super small town, like smaller than people think are small. So there was, um, I think 79 people in my graduating class and, um, it was just, we had, I, we had a school counselor that um, we had college applications that were coming at us at like 10th grade. Um, we were preparing for um, the SATs um, or the ACTs. I don't remember what I took, um, but whatever that one of those tests are um, from an early age. And it just seemed like that was the direction that we were meant to go. Carrie, you and I have talked a little bit about generational gaps, and I think a lot of it has to do with the generation um, that we grew up in where college was pushed and expected because that's what you needed to be successful or what everybody thought you needed to be successful. So um, grew up in a small town. Um, I was with the same kids from my first grade to my graduating class. Like we were all together through it all. Um, and you just got to know everybody and um, you graduated and you went on to college. That's just what you did. So I have to ask, it's a little unrelated here, but having that few kids in your class, and I know I was a teacher, the smallest class I ever taught, I think had seven, but then I also had some classes, like sections that only had four kids and it could be amazing, but it could also be horrific because the the you know you just when you know each other for that long you get all fighty and at each other's nerves what was that like for you guys so i i mean most of my classes were around like the 20 25 kids as far as a class is concerned and so we didn't necessarily have that um i'm a nerd anybody who knows me knows that so um i was convinced i was going to be a computer programmer so i was taking all of these like computer classes when i was in high school um we had a computer programming class there that was kind of created for four or five of us that had an interest in computer programming so it was an elective and um so that one only had four or five um four or five students in it, but we all had such similar interests and we were all such geeks staring at a computer that um, we kind of didn't have the nerve to fight, so. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Sounds like it worked out okay then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's interesting. You, you thought you were going to be a computer, whatever you want to call it, and now you've made your way to law school. Yeah, so when I graduated from high school, I actually enrolled at Idaho State University in their computer programming um, associates program. And so that's what I thought I wanted to do. I was programming in Visual Basic and C++ and I was doing like national competitions in um, computer programming stuff. And so that's kind of the direction that I thought I wanted to go. Um, my dad told me I was going to hate it um, and I didn't listen to him. And I probably like if it wasn't for his accident, I probably would have finished that program. And who knows whether I would have actually made a career in computer programming or not. But it was um, his death that really derailed me and made me take a hard look at where I was going. So, so what happened there? Was that part of why it took so long to finish your degree? 
Yeah. So my dad um, was unfortunately killed in a um, work-related accident. He was a construction worker and he was working on um, a road construction where um, there was a water truck that was carrying a water trailer that unhitched and essentially rolled down a hill. And my dad was laying um, cement and he was behind the cement truck. And unfortunately, he got caught in the middle of the two trucks. Um, it was it wrecked my town because my town was such a small town. Everybody knew everyone. And there were two people killed and multiple people injured um, in that accident. So um, it happened, it was August 23rd, 2001. And that just happened to be the first day of my second year of classes. And so I took that week off and my school, like most schools, has a policy that if you don't go to the first week of classes, you're withdrawn from those classes. So um, I didn't go to that next semester. So that fall semester of 2001, I didn't go to school. And I remember questioning whether it was time for me to go back or not. And this is where I did kind of get some pushback from my family. Um, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And I know that my family felt like if I didn't go back, that um, I would never go. And they probably saw me searching for some direction and searching for kind of what my life was going to hold. I'm a daddy's girl, 100%. Um, it kind of like threw me for a loop. So um, I, I think my family probably just had my best interests at heart, but it wasn't, looking back, it wasn't what I needed at the time. So I re-enrolled in the spring semester of 2002 and I didn't go back into the computer programming. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I started doing generals, but I wasn't focused. I didn't really want to be there. Um, I was struggling in every area of my life. Um, and I just sat there and for the first time in my life, failed class over class over class, just because I was, um, I felt like I was pushing forward because I was sitting in class, but I wasn't accomplishing anything. I can't even imagine what that must be like. Was, was college close to your hometown? It was about an hour away. Were you living at home or? No, I was not. Okay. Um, and gosh, I can't even imagine that the, the school wouldn't have had a policy, like a bereavement policy or something, or had you just not? I don't remember. I don't remember checking. I remember withdrawing from school. Um, and, and I don't, I don't actively remember whether I even tried to go back that semester. Okay. So you, it just seems like you kind of lost everything, your drive, your motivation. I did. And, you know, when I think about myself in high school, I knew that college was what I wanted to do, but I can't look back and think of a time where I said, you know what, I want to be this. So there was never that um, I'm going to go to school and be a doctor. I'm going to go to school and be a lawyer. Like I didn't have that career that I wanted to strive for. I just knew I wanted to go to college. And so um, I, I don't think I ever really forced myself to narrow that down. I had an interest, like I said, in computers and computer programming. Um, and I, I probably would have continued on something like that, but I chose not to go back into that program. They would have accepted me back into it, but for whatever reason, I chose not to go back. That, and that's gotta be pretty hard if you don't have a specific direction. And I think that's something a lot of kids struggle with these days that we're sending the message, go to college. And we're asking them to make all of these life decisions in that moment that they're picking a college or even moving towards picking a college. And I don't, I don't know how kids do it. I don't, and you know, the, I think that the mentality has always been that you go do your generals and you'll figure out what you like, right? I think that's always been the purpose of generals, like make everybody do a little bit of everything so they can figure out what they want to do. But what fails in that is that learning about something is completely different than doing it. And so when you go through your psychology generals or your biology generals or things like that, you may think you have an interest in it and you really have no idea what you can do with your degree in that, what profession you might be able to have or what it's even like to work in that field. And so I understand the mentality behind it of go figure out what you want to do while you're taking your generals and the rest will come. 
But I also, from personal experience, can say I wasted a lot of time and money um, going through just trying to figure out what I wanted to do along the way. Yeah. And I mean, I have to say, I kind of had the same experience. I went in to college thinking I was going to be a psychology major. I thought I was going to be a child psychologist. And I got into my psychology classes. I was able to, to test out of the 100, you know, general psychology class. And I went straight into the more content driven courses, but I was really bored in those classes. It's like, Hey, I kind of already learned all of this. And there wasn't that practical doing aspect that you mentioned. And I was just tired of reading a book and spitting back information. Um, I actually changed my major to sociology because I happened to have a class that I liked that was a lot more thinking and analytical than actually just spitting back information. And so I became a social major. Um, but yeah, it, it didn't have that whole action piece. Yeah. And I mean, I think that you find out what you don't want to do by doing the generals. And maybe that's the whole idea is you find out what you don't like, and then you can narrow down what you like. I just, and, and I don't know that there's a better way. I mean, other than you know, each person has to find their own path and they have to figure out what's, what's best for them. I certainly don't think that go to school and figure it out on, on your way is the way for everyone. Um, I can't say that my situation would have been any better because it's very possible that school was the only thing holding me together. You know, I say that I wasted time and, and money by just going, but for all I know, my life derailed and I made a ton of choices that I would not normally make. And I have a lot of close friends to think for the fact that I'm not in jail or alive, honestly. Um, I, drank way too much. I, I had some real issues that came from not dealing with my dad's death and school very well may have been the only thing that kept me from completely falling off the tracks. So it's impossible for me to say whether I would have been in a better or a worse situation if I would have taken that time off. So you were, you were going to classes. Sounds like maybe not doing so much work. Right. Going to classes. Um, sorry, I keep trying to move to, to get out of the sun. It's the one problem with outside. It's oh, no worries. Starting to lose a little bit of daylight here. Um, what, what were you filling your time with? Drinking? I mean, I worked, so I worked okay. full time. Um, and then hanging out with my friends, um, just, you know, living, living life, you know, um, nothing particular. And I mean, I wouldn't like, I loved to sing. I still have that held that on. So like we were karaoke bar addicts for sure. Um, but there wasn't any real particular thing. It was just waking up every day. And, um, I started dating somebody just before my dad died and we actually ended up getting married shortly after my dad passed away. Um, and he was about four years older than I was four or five years older than I was. So he was in, I was 19. He was in his party stages. Um, and so I was kind of subjected to that lifestyle and nothing outrageous. Like, you know, it, it was never, um, it was never to the point that I felt like it was unhealthy at the time. And when I look back, I still don't feel like it was necessarily to the point that it was like unhealthy, but I made some bad decisions and I just, it just wasn't me. It wasn't me. Are you still married? No. Oh, I was going to say, I, I, I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. Okay. Um, so how did you get yourself back on track? I mean, you can't go from failing all your classes to, to owning your own law firm. <laughs> so I think that um, it was a gradual change, but I, I can identify kind of one jolt. And that was when they told me that I didn't qualify for financial aid anymore. Like I hadn't worried about anything because I was getting financial aid. I was working full time. Like I was just getting my check for going to school and, you know, all was great. And then when you show up and they say, too bad, your grades are too low. Your GPA, I think my GPA was like a 1.75. Um, you can't, you can't get financial aid. If you want to continue going to school and your GPA.
Hello, did I, are you back? I'm back. Okay, like cool. Back I, perfect. Sorry. So, um, losing my, losing my financial aid and having to pay for it out of pocket was kind of a wake up call for me that this is not an unlimited source of funds to just mess around with. And that I kind of need to figure out my life and my family. Like I was the laughing stock of my family for the, they were proud of me. They were proud of me for going to school, but my little brothers were, they still joke with me about how long it took me to get through school. So it was like every family reunion, it was like, is Amber going to you know, do we want to take any bets on how long Amber's going to go to school? Now we talk about it now because the joke's on them because they both took three years off and it took them just as long to graduate. The difference is that they took the time off and they went off and they did what they needed to do and then they went back. Um, but you know, you live and you learn and I was, you know, not doing that. So I got myself back on track, um, probably by having to pay for it and have some actual skin in the game. What, what did that feel like looking back once you finally realized like, oh crap, I have to make this happen? Was that, go for it. Um, no, it's, it's an interesting question and I've never really thought about it before. Um, I, I just, I, I knew that I needed to graduate. And I knew that I always felt like I was destined. Like there was never this point in my life where I didn't think I was going to be able to take care of myself, where I didn't think I was going to be successful. Um, I just needed to. Yeah. So. So you realized that you got back on track. How long did it take you then to finish your BA? So I had a friend of mine who had enrolled in a paralegal program and I remember um, she asked me if she was one of my best friends from high school and we had gone to college together and um, she was taking a constitutional law course. And my dad had always told me I should go to law school. And I can remember conversations with him um, telling me that we should go to law school. He, um, we used to read, that was our thing. So he would read a book and I would read a book and then we would switch and then we would talk about it. And my books were always legal thrillers. I was reading Gr John Grisham when I was in like fourth grade. Like it was, it was just what I loved. And so he kept telling me, you know, you should go to law school. And I remember my senior year of high school telling him, dad, drop it, not going to law school. Like nobody likes lawyers. I like friends. Those two don't go together. Like I'm not going. And then my friend enrolled in the paralegal program and she took a const constitutional law course. And she asked me if I would enroll in it with her. And I remember just loving the topic, um, enjoying the professor. The professor just, he amazed me. He still does now when I think back on those classes about being able to stand in front of a class and rattle off constitutional cases and know who decided them and who wrote the opinion and never have to look at a book and just like be able to know that information because he was so passionate about it. And so we took another one. So we took constitutional law too. And then I started taking some politics classes and some international law classes. And I decided that um, maybe the legal field was for me. Um, so I told myself I was gonna enroll in her paralegal program. And at some point in time, I, I filled out the application. I actually had my acceptance to them, to the paralegal program, and I was getting ready to submit it. And there was just something that told me I was never gonna be happy being a paralegal. And that if I was going to do this, I was going to go all the way. And I made the decision at that point to go to law school. And it took me three years to finish my bachelor's from then. I did, um, I'm sorry, two years from that point because I did, I was taking summer classes. I didn't take a month off from the time that I decided this is what I wanted to do. I was taking spring, fall, and summer classes. I was taking three classes every summer. So clearly you had that drive back and you were just ready to take off. Yeah, it came back, so found that's something so, I was passionate about. That's so interesting. My, my dad really thought I should go to law school, and I thought about it for a long time, and I also considered doing a paralegal program. I just, the funny parallels there. Yeah. Um, so what do you do now practicing law? 
Okay, so now I work, um, as you mentioned, I practice criminal defense and immigration, and particularly um, my passion falls where criminal defense and immigration overlap. And so a lot of people, um, even attorneys, don't really understand the interplay between the two. They just know that there are immigration consequences to getting arrested. But when you have somebody who's in the United States lawfully, they have their green card, they've done everything right to get up here, and then they get arrested, there's, there could be some serious consequences for their arrest that don't exist for United States citizens. So um, kind of the timeline without going too far into it um, and boring all of your listeners is pre-2010, there was no duty of criminal defense attorneys to talk to their clients about immigration consequences. So it was considered completely separate. Do what you want to do with the criminal case, deal with the immigration consequences later. But in 1996, laws started to change and immigration consequences started to get harsher. And in 2010, those harsh immigration consequences for criminal activity finally caught up with the law. And the Supreme Court said, no, that, that can't be the case. If somebody can lose their green card and get deported because of criminal activity, then their attorney has a duty to talk to them about the immigration consequences of any plea bargains they're going to take. So we have a split right now in immigration attorneys of people who have been practicing before 2010 and are used to practicing in a world where they didn't have to even consider immigration consequences. And the post-2010 world where Attorneys know they have to consider immigration consequences, but very few people understand what those consequences are because they're super complex. So I have a consulting part of my business where I work as that gap between the criminal defense world and the immigration world. And I consult with criminal defense attorneys who are representing non-citizens to help them understand what the immigration consequences are and make sure their clients are properly advised of all of the consequences um, on the immigration side, and then help them find out whether there are better options to negotiate the case that may protect their ability to remain in the United States. So that's what I love doing. Um, I also have just a straight criminal defense and a straight immigration practice. Um, on the immigration practice, I practice family-based immigration. So I work with people who want to bring family members here from other countries or people who are in the United States, get married, have children, um, and want to find out whether or not they can get their green card or later apply for citizenship. Wow, you are a special lady. <laughs> Thank you. So you work directly with clients and consult? Yes. Other lawyers, got it, yes. okay. Um, I don't, I can't imagine how you just, how you balance it all. <laughs> you know, it's crazy because my paralegal says the same thing and she keeps telling me, especially with the podcast starting and then we met at Thrive and I love going to these events because I meet the most amazing people that just push me to be better. And so as I keep adding more to my plate, she's like, Amber, you don't have all time. All, you don't have time for all this. And I'm like, yeah, I do. I just got to find it. Like it's never a time problem. What, what did we, what did we learn at, Fri at Thrive? Don't say no, say how. So right. I'm like, don't tell me I don't have time. I'm like, let's figure out how I can fit this into my schedule. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, someone else says, I can't think of who it is right now. If you want to get something done, ask a busy person to do it. Right. And, you know, I, I think there is a fine line between saying yes to everything and saying yes and making purposeful choices. Absolutely. Right. But when something becomes important enough, I think that you really can choose to make time for it. Absolutely. And I, um, you have to be real with yourself. Like you can't bullshit yourself. So I know how much free time I have. I know how many movies I watch a week. I know how much I don't do that could be filled with um, a better use of my time. And so until I feel like I'm not doing those things at an excessive level, then I'm not going to let anybody tell me that I don't have time to do things that are going to benefit my life and others. And I'm not saying that that downtime's not important, but when you know that you're, um, when you know that you have more downtime than you need, then there's always time to fit something else into your schedule that's going to benefit your life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I know I'm doing 75 hard. I've talked about it on the show. Um, having those rules to live by are making me so much more productive because I right. can, I can 
reframe anything to myself and say, well, if I can get these 75 hard tasks done, I can do these other ones too. It's, it's not like I, it's, it's almost like it's clearing up more time because I can go at it with that relentless attitude of, well, if I can do this, I can do this too. There's no reason why I can't. Yeah. The thing I love about 75 hard, I mean, I only made it four days. Um, I'm hoping to restart at some point, but we just talked about potentially moving it in gradually. Um, but the thing that I like about it is that it correlates so much with the mindset of the NLP training that I've done. And I'm going to be finishing my NLP training this year. But that's when my mindset really started to change because I learned how to listen to myself when I'm um, not being honest. So I learned that little voice in my head that you like, or that feeling in your gut that you feel when you, when you say something and you know it's just not true. When you tell yourself you can't do something, when you tell yourself you don't have time, when you tell yourself you're not good enough or that you're not the person to be delivering a content or whatever it is that you're saying, and then you get that feeling in your gut. Like I've learned to listen to that and, and know that that's my mind telling me that I'm not being honest with myself about my capabilities. And so that's helped a lot with the time management and knowing what I can fit into my schedule too. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, so how does your podcast fit into all of this? So my podcast is a product of my journey over the last three years. So I, um, graduated from undergrad in 2009 and I immediately moved to Michigan for law school and I, um, finished law school in, um, three years. So 2009, I graduated from law school in January of 2000 and, um, 13. So three and a half years. Is that when I graduated? Yeah. So I know um, I was, I was tracking now. <laughs> like, how old am I turning this year? When did I graduate college? Yeah. So I enrolled in the fall of 2009 and I finished law school at the end of 2012, moved to Vegas, but I didn't officially graduate until the beginning of 2013. So I, um, worked to pass the bar. I worked to get my first job and, um, kept pushing towards whatever it was that I felt like was next on my plate. And finally, in March of 2016, I crashed and I had um, what I consider a full-on breakdown. I use that term loosely because there are people who have experienced much worse than what I went through. But for me, this was enough. Um, I had about four or five days of just the worst anxiety attack I'd ever had. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. And that was the first time that I had acknowledged that I hadn't really stopped since my dad died. Like I had, I had never sought help. I had never really talked about the um, experiences. I had other deaths in between that time. I had a lot of things that had happened and I, I just didn't deal with any of it. And instead I kept pushing myself towards this idea of when I graduate from law school and when I'm working as an attorney, all this crap that I feel over here and all this um, emptiness and unhappiness is going to disappear because then I'm going to be happy. And I forced myself to go start um, seeing a therapist. And so, so since March of 2016 until now, it's been just a journey of me um, tearing down the walls that I had built around myself in the 15 years after my dad had died. And so last year, I felt the need to share my story. And I just wasn't sure um, how I wanted to do it. I thought it was going to be in a blog. And so I started a blog and it just didn't uh, materialize to anything. I, I work all day in front of a computer. I write, I read. I didn't want to write and read more. And so it was hard for me to sit down and write. And then who's going to read it? Like, I don't know if anybody's going to sit down and read that. It's not as personable as a podcast or, or this. And so um, when I started really getting in tune with what I wanted and who I was, um, eventually about six months ago, the realization that it needed to be a podcast came to me. And so since then, I've been working on getting this launched. So it's all really about the things that I wish I would have known back when I broke down, that I'm not alone, that everybody goes through this, that these feelings of anxiety are normal, that um, to some extent, 
Like it's not not feeling emotions. It's a healthy level of emotions and how you deal with those. You know, it shouldn't be on one side prescribing medication. And I'm not a doctor for anybody, but um, it shouldn't be prescribing medication because you feel sad. Um, unless that medication needs to be prescribed, it should be figuring out whether or not that's a healthy emotion. We've gotten, I think, to the point in our society where whenever you feel emotions, you've got to figure out why and stop it. And um, that, I think, led to the fact that every time I felt something, I shoved it down and tried to push it out and focused on school. And now that I look back after three years, I can say that the thing that caused my breakdown was not having my next achievement to focus on. It was graduate from college, graduate from law school, pass the bar, get a job, reach the income level I wanted to reach. What do I do after that? I didn't have any more goals. I didn't have anything to focus on. And then everything came crashing down. So that's kind of where my podcast stems from. Wow. So I, I really feel you on that emotional piece because I am someone who I act well I have emotions but other people don't often see them um yes they don't I don't share them and I think there's a huge movement of movements probably not not the right word but um we often especially with our boys I feel like tell them no you can't show that emotion you can't express it and that whole idea that you were saying that these emotions are bad. Um, I'm trying to reteach my students that I work with a lot of kids with anxiety and, and teaching them that worry and fear are normal emotion, yeah. but then you have to decide what you're going to do. And sometimes we should listen to the worry and the fear. It's there for a reason. And then other times, maybe it's, it's starting to take control of us in a way we don't want. And that's when we step back and say, okay, what do I do next? How can I, how can I cope? How can I push through this? What's my next step? Um, yeah. And I mean, on, on the point that you were making about sharing emotions, I am generally pretty skeptical of somebody who shares a considerable amount of emotions because you can share and not deal with it. Because I believe me, I did. I people used to say to me that they were surprised I could talk about my dad's accident without getting upset. And there became a point about three or four years after he passed away that I could tell everybody every detail of his accident and not cry. And they and they would say to me, like, how can you do that? And I would say, Oh, well, at this point in time, like it's just it's just the way that it is. And I didn't realize that probably wasn't normal um, to to separate myself that much from the emotion. And so there's a difference between sharing it and dealing with it. And so when somebody's out there and they're just bleh, all of their emotions, I wonder whether they're actually dealing with them on the inside or not. And the same thing for somebody who keeps them all inside. You, you've got to have somebody to talk to. That doesn't have to be a public forum and it doesn't have to be like broadcasting it on a skywriter. But um, you got to have somebody that you can confide in um, to make sure that you're dealing with those emotions, sharing them and then figuring out what they mean and whether they're trying to tell you something about the direction your life's going. Does it need to change? Are you on the right direction? That's all our emotions are, is telling us like something isn't working with what we're doing and our body's trying to tell us that we need to change something. Yeah. Um, and then what about on the other side, like those positive emotions? And I think too, a lot of times we don't see people experiencing them. I almost think like sometimes, and I would say maybe this is more for women, I don't really know, but sometimes we almost tell ourselves we can't act happy or be happy because we don't deserve it. Yeah, I think that that's a, I think that's a universal feeling, but um, society, and, and I, I'm saying this knowing that it's shifting, but society where kind of it used to be was you don't talk about your accomplishments because that's bragging. Um, don't put your life on social media. Even when Facebook came, the only thing that you saw was fake stuff on social media. Like nobody had a real conversation on social media until recently, which led to everybody thinking that everybody else's life was perfect and their life was shit. So um, the... I think that we have kind of been trained that nobody needs to know about 
kind of what you're feeling. Like that's something that you need to take care of. But if something great happens in your life, like don't go rub it in everybody's faces. And we don't see that there's that line between celebrating and being proud of what we've accomplished. And we have to acknowledge that. Um, and just out there, like bragging on whatever we're doing. Like, and I think it comes down to intention. Like, what is the purpose of you, of you sharing this? Like, do you need to acknowledge it? And if so, like, what's the purpose of you doing it on this forum? Yeah. I was listening to an interview with Bradley, who was, he didn't speak at Thrive. He spoke at Elevator Night. I can't remember if you were. I did, but I had to leave early because I had like adult responsibilities in court the next morning. So, (laughs) Um, so, okay. Bradley and Yaya Bakar. Yaya was the MC at Thrive. Yeah. And Yaya said, you can tell the difference between like a quality speaker or now I think, and because we're living in a world of personal branding where, where you're supposed to build your brand around being vulnerable and all of these things. And, and Yaya said the real difference is when you're using that story and those emotions and whatever it is in service right? instead of for significance. You're Absolutely. To, to help others and to communicate, um, communicate how you can help them, you know, not to just say like, oh, look at me. I have this awesome life or, Oh, look at me. I'm so like, I have this pitiful life, but it's, it's all about that act of service. Yeah. 100%. And, and I think that, um, number one, it's clear who's doing that and who's not. And number two, um, the people who aren't, um, either number one, they haven't been, they don't know how they think that they are doing this in service and they just haven't figured out how that's supposed to be yet. Or, they haven't dealt with some emotions that they need to feel and that happiness is fake and they're covering up for something. Um, so everyone keeps telling me I need to watch The Power of Vulnerability. Yes. By Netflix, uh, Brene Brown, right? And I yeah, I, I'm just totally too scared to do it. No, do it. So I actually just, my podcast that released today, so my podcast released, released Monday and Fridays. And Mondays are interview episodes, Fridays are solo episodes. And Friday, today's episode was my review of all three of her TED Talks because that's where my, my very first therapy appointment, that's the first thing she gave me to listen to. And it changed my life. Um, so she has the power of vulnerability, listening to shame, and your critics aren't the one who count. Those are her three TED Talks. And then she just released a Netflix special. All four of those, like, you, it, it, it just has to happen. Okay. It's so important. Like, yeah. So I'll do that when you do 75 hard. Okay. Be so, <laughs> crap. Now I have something, now I have something to, um, on the line. No, she yeah. is amazing. Um, really where I come from and my core values all started because of her, um, her, TED Talks and her teachings and really taking that to heart. And so I have a very special place in my journey for Brene Brown. It's interesting too, because my husband has said, I need to look at her stuff. And I'm very, I'm very wary of like the female industry. I don't know what the word for it is. And, and whenever I see her, I think she's, I just get the impression she's like, very female centric and girl power and whatever. Oh. My husband's like, no, not at all. No. But I just can't get past it. But I also know for me, and I bet this is a, a big thing for you too. Whenever something is a hard no for me, I'm realizing that's something I really need to explore. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's normally like I'm afraid to watch it for some reason or another. And I know that it's going to impact my life if I do. Um, I just need to get past that. So when you're ready, you'll watch it. I mean, when, when you're ready, but I will tell you that I have not met a person who has listened to that, that shares the values that we share. Cause I feel like you and I are kind of on a similar wavelength, yeah. um, and has not taken positive impact from it. All right. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, so 
tell us about, I'm totally shifting gears here. Um, tell us about Trial by Peers. This is an organization, what, I don't know, organization, what's the right term for it? Yeah, so it's a program that is put on by the Clark County Law Foundation. And I became a part of it because when I opened my um, law firm, I wanted to be able to be more involved in the community. And another attorney friend of mine had suggested this program called the Trial by Peers program. Um, I've handled a few cases that are juvenile cases, and I don't normally handle them because I have a really hard time handling cases where I can't help the children because I can't help parents who don't want to be helped. And um, it just becomes too heartbreaking for me. And many people will tell me that's where you're needed. Um, I just, I know my emotional limits and I can't. So I didn't take very many GB cases. But when I got introduced to this program, um, it was just, I, I love everything about it. Um, so the rundown of the program is that when um, individuals that are junior high and high school aged are um, charged with minor misdemeanor offenses, um, and we're talking like curfew violations, maybe um, a fray or fighting, um, marijuana possession, minor marijuana possession, drug paraphernalia, things like that, things that are nonviolent and that are um, minor misdemeanor offenses. The district attorney has the option to allow them to enter into the trial by peers program. And the trial by peers program is where if the student and the parents or guardian both agree that they will participate in this program, then they go through a true court process where they are represented and defended by students their own age that are also a part of this program. The um, Each peer counselor, who's the student, has an attorney who has volunteered that helps them work on the cases and guides them through the process, and then attorneys volunteer as judges. The jury that determines guilt or innocence and um, imposes penalty is um, students their own age. Um, they are a mixture of people who have been ordered to be there as part of their, as part of their punishment and people who are interested in the legal system so they choose to volunteer. And the penalties that are imposed are anything from volunteering at jury duties to writing letters of apology, um, classes on whatever needs to be, excuse me, whatever needs to be determined at that point. It could be decision making or um, drug classes or, you know, they have about 10 or 15 different classes that you can choose from. And the whole idea is that the kids get individualized attention and opportunities that they wouldn't get if they were placed in the juvenile system. It's for first time offenders only. It's a one shot opportunity to take somebody who made a bad choice, but we can still affect them in a way that's not throwing them in the juvie system and just hoping that they don't get back in trouble um, and allow them to understand the consequences of their actions and then turn that around by being a part of the program at a later time. So for the, for the peer counselors, they have to go to like a, a mini law school in the summer and they have to take classes on evidence and civil procedure and criminal procedure and all the things we learned in law school that scaled down for the education level of a high school student. It allows people to figure out whether law school's for them before they spend $200,000 on student loans. But then it also gives these kids who just made bad choices the support that they need to understand why that choice was not in their best interests and turn that around before they have a true criminal record. Is there any sort of tracking on the, um, I don't know, efficacy of the program? So there is, I don't have access to those numbers. I could probably track them down. Um, a good friend of mine is on the board for the Clark County Law Foundation and she, um, is very involved in this program. And her and I have talked about the fact that the program has been successful, but I don't have the statistics on how many people have um, come back and commit crimes afterwards. What, what do you see uh, are the benefits to the, the offenders who go through it and also to the community? 
So the um, offenders that go through it, I, they get um, an understanding of how their actions affect other people in a way that they may not get otherwise. Um, for a lot of these kids, this is a wake up call. Um, this is the first time that they've ever been in trouble. Um, it would be easy for us to just take them into a juvenile court system, find them, um, tell them not to do it again. But what are they going to learn from that? So being in a situation where their parent or guardian has to be involved, where they have to take time off of work sometimes to come in and be a part of this, your actions have now affected the lives of the people that are in your family because they have to be a part of this program as well. Um, and, and understanding the potential consequences of... Um, continuing to act in the way that they're acting and also understanding that there are resources available to help you in the event that you need additional help that you're not getting from school or home. I, I just think it must be incredibly helpful. I work with a lot of kids who get in trouble a lot, not like big trouble, but you know, they're getting lots of phone calls home, um, suspensions, and so not, you know, not, oh, Johnny was calling out in class, but repeated pretty noticeable infractions. But the kids themselves say, well, there's no real consequence. Right. I just get sent right back to school. And I feel like then, and I, I've had it happen to a few students who actually get in real trouble, thankfully not with the law, but real significant trouble. And their response to me is the same. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Like nothing's ever happened to me before. Why would it happen now? Yeah. I mean, if, if you take this juvenile and you put them through the GB system, the record's going to seal at 18 or 21, whatever your state laws are. If you order them to pay a fine, their parents are probably going to pay it or not, depending on their parents. Um, and the consequences are maybe not even held on the child themselves. The parents may feel that more. Forcing somebody to write a letter of apology for something that you would never think of, like for dad having to take off of work to be with you, or for grandma waking up and realizing that you had taken her car for a joyride, or... Um, you know, a letter of apology to a school principal for the disrupting class, like things that you wouldn't realize at that age are consequences of your actions because they don't affect you, um, is a huge impact. But then I also think the other side of that is when kids are making these kind of choices, very rarely is it out of a desire to actually do something wrong. It's out of a desire of either the rules don't apply to me and I, and they haven't been shown how they do a lack of respect or they're attention seeking and whatever one of those three things there are, they learn through the classes that they have to take that there are um, resources out there to help you. Um, I refuse to believe um, that kids that, get arrested for these small things do so because they wanted to go out and break the law. They just didn't realize they, they don't understand that their actions have consequences or that the rules apply to them. And many times not the parents fault. I'm not blasting anyone, but many times it's because they don't have, nobody sat them down and made them realize that their actions have consequences. Yeah. And especially when they, they have been issued or if they have been issued minor consequences along the way that the kids are just dismissing or they don't really matter. I mean, who cares about being suspended from school? Most of the kids would rather not be at school anyway. Right. Um, and there was another point I wanted to bring up and now, now I forget why did it. Oh, and, and I think also we forget that we're, we're talking about kids whose brains are truly different. They're not fully developed and though they may realize there could be a consequence to the action that they're doing, their brains are not developed such that they're necessarily connecting that consequence with themselves and that action they are taking. They don't have that like, whoa, wait a minute, I have to pull back and see that this could actually happen to me. 
that part hasn't really developed yet. Yeah, for sure. And um, one of the really big things, like people are split on whether they believe that NLP works or it doesn't, or whether it's a good science or a bad science. And everybody has their opinion. For me, I know the impact that it's made in my life. But one of the things that we talk about a lot is the impact that a parent's words have on their children on a lasting um, basis. You know, we're imprinted between the ages of zero and seven years old. And that affects everything that we do for the rest of our lives unless we deal with what we heard during those imprints. So a lot of times it could be like parents do the best that they can with the resources that they have. They were brought up a certain way and that impacts the way that they act, that impacts the way that they raise their children. And at some point in time, there has to be a break to that cycle. And that's what I think this program does is help both parents and children understand that there's a better way. And that's why I say it's not the parent's fault. I I know very few parents who don't care about their children. You know, everybody wants the best for their children and they're doing the best they can with the resources they have keeping a kid out of the juvie system and giving them an opportunity to grow in a way other than making your parent pay something and then yelling at you when they get home because they just had to spend money that they probably may or may not have had doesn't accomplish anything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I feel the same way about teachers as I do with parents in that Every teacher I know, every parent I know is absolutely showing up doing the exact best that they can. And I think also we're not careful enough in the language we use. So we may mean something, we may have the best of intentions, but unfortunately sometimes the way we're saying it and the words we're using are not necessarily communicating that. 100%. And I mean, it comes down to little things like... um, what the best example that I can use is the one that was used for me in my training. And that's, um, we don't have money for that. The impact of saying we don't have money for that when you're talking to a child, um, has so much more impact than people realize, um, because it causes people to grow up thinking they live in a world of scarcity. It causes people to think that they live in a world where money is a finite resource and that, they are not going to necessarily grow up to have everything that they need. Um, And that's just one example, but that idea of scarcity works into every area of their life, not just financial related. And the parent didn't do anything wrong. They were 100% right. They probably didn't have the money for what the kid wanted, but it's the words that you use that causes lifelong consequences. In that situation, what would be another suggested conversation to have? So the when, when my trainer went through this, what she talks about was um, she uses the um, needs versus wants analogy. And she says, you know, my job is to provide you with what you need. And you need shelter and food um, and water. And she says, your job is to provide yourself with what you want. And if I choose to give, to help you get what you want, then I am choosing to make that my job. Until then, if you want this, let's figure out together how we can get that for you. And then that could be chores. It could be whatever you guys decide, but putting it on the child to have some skin in the game in whatever way the parent feels necessary to know that there's a difference between wants and needs. And if you want something, you have to figure out how you're going to legally obtain that. And I say legally because that could go, I mean, I'm an attorney that could go a whole right. different way. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so here's, here's a situation I deal with a lot. I work with kids who, who have not been on winning streaks, as Charlie Rocket would say. They have experienced so much failure. Maybe they don't even realize it, but because of their ADHD or their learning disability or their anxiety, they're constantly being asked to do things and they're constantly falling short. So they're just like sinking down to the bottom of the ocean. And every time they try to do something and they're falling short, they're just sinking further. And then it it kind of creates this vicious cycle where then they don't even want to initiate. And when, when I work with kids, what I do is 
I don't, I don't ignore the failure. You know, let's say they were supposed to turn in assignment A and they forgot to turn it in. I take, you know, like, okay, you didn't turn in. What are we going to do next? Right. How are we going to turn it in if you didn't turn it in today? And I, you know, I don't kind of moan and groan over the failure and I don't, you know, I'm not dismissing it, but at the same time, I always come from a, a place of action and moving forward. Um, yeah. But what are, if you can think of any, I'm totally putting you on the spot. <laughs> what are some like conversations that, that might be able to be helpful in that sort of situation? Well, one of my favorite, one of my favorite sayings is there's no failure, only feedback. And the idea that and, and I talk about failure a lot in my podcast because I think it's a huge part of success. Um, there's another one that says um, the success is just failing until you don't. And I actually have like Bobby Bones has a book called Fail Until You Don't. And I love it. And he's talking about how his whole successful life is the fact that he just didn't quit. Like he continued to fail and continued to fail until he didn't quit. And I think that it's important for kids to learn that at a young age that, um, Failing is, um, so many people hate the word failure. I still use it. Um, failure is inevitable. What you do after that is important. And so do you still do that? Like your teacher may or may not take that assignment anymore. Do you still do it? Like that's something that, that would, if I was in your position, that would be my question. Like, let's still do it because it needs to get done. Um, but it's, it's all about just changing that mentality to, I didn't get it done this time. Let's figure out how I can get it done next time. And I love what you said about, you know, let's look forward. Let's figure out how we can change it for the next time. Um, but it's got, I think, I believe it has to come from a place of not saying, okay, I failed at this. Let's move on to the next assignment that that has to get done to make any type of an impact. Yeah. So you're, you're not dismissing the fact that whatever it was didn't get done. Oh, that's okay. Let's move on. It's, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, good. I'm glad we would agree there. That's pretty much <laughs> what I do. <laughs> um, and then I, I hear a lot of times. So basically what we're talking about here is growth mindset. I don't know if you know that. Term. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, that we talk about it at school all the time that we need to instill a growth mindset in our kids. But then I feel like a lot of times the language we're using isn't really doing that. You know, when, when kids fail a test, then it's done and they're moving on to the next thing anyway. And when, um, you know, when they miss a deadline, well, you know, too bad, it's a zero. Or we, I hear often teachers saying, well, you should already know this. You know, when kids ask questions for clarity, well, I already told you that, or you should already know that. Um, like how, how can we reframe those conversations? You know, it's so difficult. I, I don't have an educational background. Um, I don't even pretend to know what teachers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I, I think that our public school system is focused on the wrong things. And you, you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, um, we're focused on how to statistically get somebody to have the grades that they need to move on to the next point in their life. We're not necessarily focused on teaching them anything that they really need to know for life, if that makes sense. Um, financial success. Um, I was, a, my mom was a big believer in high school that um, a beginner's mechanic course, a basic mechanic course should be a part of every public education that, you know, things that are like life educational things that we don't, that don't get stressed because they're not a part of that math, English history curriculum. Um, and so I think that at first it comes down to changing what the public system is designed to accomplish. Um, there's some historical um, information that indicates that the ABCD grade system came from the industrial period where we were trying to teach people that they needed to become factory workers. And it was like placing people in particular ways for factory workers. And whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. However, 
I can certainly see how it has become a factory system to get our kids into college or into high school, into high school and out of high school. And then move them on to the next step where what they're actually learning may be um, substandard. So I think that that's the first thing because your teachers are stuck in a situation where they maybe can't spend the amount of time that needs to be spent with that child and still meet the expectations that are set on them by their educational institution. And so until that changes from the top, it doesn't give our teachers the permission to be able to spend the time that's necessary with those kids. And then what happens is those kids get put off into this other section for kids that aren't learning fast enough. And now all of a sudden in their head, they're different than everybody else. So all around the system's broken. And I don't pretend to have the answers. I don't know what they are. I don't know how you fix it. I don't know what the better answers are, but this is not, it it can't be the best that we can do. And you know, this is, this is, terrible. People ask me all the time, how would I fix the system? And I don't have an answer to that. And, you know, we're so here in the U.S., we're big, we're diverse, we have mandated education. Within all of those, and those are all wonderful things, but I don't know how we create a a system that accommodates it all. And, um, man, I lost my train of thought again. Um, I, oh, I was talking about this with someone else lately about how a lot of people would make the argument that the things you were suggesting should be taught at home and not at school and schools for academics. But then on the other side of the equation is we live in a culture that's very fast paced. Kids don't spend much time at home and there's not a lot of time for much of anything to happen at home because kids are in school for so long and in a boatload of extracurricular activities, which are all wonderful experiences, but we can't, you know, there's only limited opportunity for the parents to help their kids when we're asking the kids to be in school and in all these other activities. Well, and not only that, but we're asking a generation of people who went through the same school program to teach stuff that they may or may not have ever been taught. I can tell you if my, if my parents were left to teach me about financial success. I don't know that I'm, well, first of all, my personal finances are nobody's like dream um, personal finance situation. So it's not like I um, came out on the top there. I've had to work through some, some failures in that area as well. But um, I know that my parents struggled and that their personal finances weren't necessarily where they needed to be too. So if we're saying that needs to be taught at home, what, what, are, what if they're not capable of doing that? We're asking somebody who doesn't have the skills and knowledge to teach something that they were never taught. Absolutely. Have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I have not, but it's on my list. Okay. So that's exactly what, what that book is saying. I'm reading it right now for the first time. I feel like I'm really slow uh, coming, coming into that camp. Like everyone around me has read that book. And man, I wish I had read it in high school. Um, and I'm totally going to be recommending it to my, my older students. But it, it was saying exactly that. And here's just like the most basic of example. Rich people, however you want to define that, consider their own house a liability because it's money going out on your mortgage, on all the stuff that's in your house, on your property taxes, whatever. And middle-class people will consider their house an asset because eventually it could be cash producing. But because because it's not cash producing right now, the rich people, because that's the term that the book uses, would would consider it a liability. Um, And that, that... you know, you should only have liabilities from the money that you're making from your assets, uh, your, you know, your cash producing assets. Then if you want to take some of that money and purchase a liability in full, go for it. Um, I can't wait to get to the end of the book. Like I'm, I'm only kind of like right in the very beginning. I'm like, man, there's going to be so much good stuff in here for me. Yeah. I mean, well, and the, the other thing that, cause we can sit here and talk about this all we want, but we're never going to solve all the problems. So like when I opened my business, 
I knew that I had never wanted to own a business before. I knew nothing about being a business owner. I knew I, nothing. I had, my dad owned his own construction company and my mom watched him struggle. And so it was kind of just drilled into me that you go work for somebody. I remember getting some pushback from my mom when I told her I was going to open my own business. But I, um, I thought that I had learned everything that I needed. Like I knew I was going to make mistakes. So I worked really hard to make sure that I surrounded myself with people who were able to help me correct those mistakes. And then I just made different ones, ones I didn't know existed. And so no matter what we do to try to teach people, um, everything that we see right now as the faults, new ones are going to pop up that are getting, so, you know, the best that we can do is give people the life skills that they need to be able to get through those failures um, or those hurdles or those obstacles to be able to push forward because it is physically impossible to teach somebody everything they need to know. Absolutely. And, and the world is always changing and that's going to create more gray area of things we don't know about and we need to learn about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So, one of the questions I'd like to ask everyone is what routines do you have that you attribute your success to? Like, do you have a morning routine or a meditation practice or anything that just keeps you going? So my, um, routine, like I, I like to work out in the mornings. Um, I don't always get it done. Um, my health routine and eating, routine kind of fluctuates. I'm either really good or really bad, one of the two. Um, but I notice that I'm more on my game when I get up and I do a workout in the morning and I prep my meals for the week and I do what I need to do that way. Um, I have a couple of podcasts that I listen to. Um, I, I play my piano. Um, so when I get home at night, I actually play my piano every night before I go to bed um, because it just relaxes me and kind of sets myself up for a good night and then, you know, moving on. Um, I try to put my mindset, I have um, words of affir affirmation written on my bathroom mirror in um, dry erase marker. And so I change those out. I have a gratitude portion of my mirror where when I wake up in the morning, I write down what I'm grateful for. And I like force myself to actually write it on my mirror. And, sorry. And then I write down something that I hope to accomplish for that day. Like what's one thing that I want to accomplish for that day. And that's the first thing that I look at when I get up in the morning. And it's also the first thing I look at before I go to bed because I'm washing my face and brushing my teeth. And so it's my goal setting and my check. Did I accomplish what I needed to accomplish today? And if not, what can I do to make sure that happens tomorrow? I love it that that is, that it's right there on your mirror. Um, especially the, the gratitude piece. Like rather than it being in a certain journal or one of those cell phone apps, it's like right there, you see it. It's your reminder to get it done. And what you said about you see it at night before you go to bed too. I have recently read that like when you have an affirmation or something like that, uh, in order to wake up positive, you want to go to bed positive. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think it was you that posted to social media a little while ago about words of affirmation and was talking about how um, words of affirmation shouldn't just be, you know, I'm beautiful, I'm this, I'm that, but they should be something that is actually actionable for you. Like, yes. how is this going to impact you? What you are this and want to accomplish this. And so um, I had had these sections in my mirror anyways, to begin with. And I would have quotes, um, on my mirror and it would rotate between what I felt like I needed to see in the mornings. Um, but after you and I had that conversation, I actually changed it to the gratitude piece and then the, what I want to accomplish piece, because I felt like that better fit what words of affirmation should be. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's apparently some research out there. I haven't seen it myself that kind of says that sometimes having those I am affirmations, yeah. you know, I am confident can actually minimize the action because it's assuming that you already are. So there's, you know, people on the other side would say that it's, it's kind of activating your reticular activating system. And then you're going to start looking for ways to be confident. So, you know, I don't know, I'm not an expert on it, but that, that actionable affirmation idea just resonated with me. Yeah. And I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer with there. I tend to be a little bit 
more cautious with using the words I am um, now than I used to be because over the last six months, I've realized that my entire identity used to be tied to being an attorney. And it wasn't until I pushed off of that that and started like doing this podcast and doing other things that I started to really gain my life back and gain my identity back and realize who I was. And so I really started to, when you say I am, you're talking about an identity piece for you. And I tend to be very careful what I attribute my identity to after having to break through not knowing who I am. I love that. And I, I feel like we live in a world where so much of who we are is perceived by our career or our job. And while that can be a piece of who you are, if you want it to be, there really should be a whole lot more to a person than just what they do for a job. 100%. And I've, I've said this to other people as well. Like we need to stop asking kids what they want to be when they grow up. I, I, I don't, I just don't like it. Like let them be kids help them have goals for whatever those goals are. But your six-year-old doesn't need to have goals for when she's 20. Like, let her have her goals now. And then after going through these trainings where you learn how the words impact, I have no science to back this up, but I have come to believe that when you ask somebody what they want to be, you are presupposing that they are not good enough as they are. And we should always feel like we are either, um, I don't want to say just happy with who we are because that's such flu-flu crap, but we should always be, um, accept, our inse- accept our insecurities, accept our faults, figure out if they are bothersome enough to us to want to change and move past. But we should never be saying that we want to change certain things about ourselves. It will never work. My weight, I hate my weight. And until I'm willing to accept it and accept myself in the form that I am now and then change it for reasons other than wanting to be different, I'm never going to be able to keep it off. And that's what I struggle with constantly. That's why I haven't been able to change um, my weight yet. So, you know, I don't like that we instill that in kids from the beginning. I think that we can always grow as people and we should be devoted to growing. Yes. But that accepting who you are, you're not growing because you're bad or there's something not good enough about you. You're growing because as an individual, we should have that growth mindset. We should always be trying to be better for ourselves and the people around us. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between saying, okay, I'm, I accept who I am and I know that I'm capable of being better. So let's figure out how I can get there and saying, I don't like this about myself. So let's change it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, wow, that's, really juicy. (laughs) Thanks. So I think I'll wrap up here because that was just so good. Um, (laughs) What would you say to young people who are kind of floating through life, getting by, like, like you were in that position when you were going for your bachelor's in the beginning, just like you'd lost your motivation, you'd lost your direction, how can you inspire someone who's going through that and doesn't have that relevancy in their lives because, you know, they're kids to just take the next step to getting to where they need to go? Any good words of wisdom there for them or for me so yeah. I can tell them? So, you know, I'm going to say this and it's so much easier to say than it is to do. So um, I start this by saying good luck. But um You have to be able to be real with yourself and authentic about what you want. Um, I wish that I would have stepped back and just been real about what I wanted to accomplish. And you may not know. And if you don't know, acknowledge that you don't know and then figure out what your step is now while you figure it out. Um, But until we're really willing to get real with ourselves to stop wanting to please the people around us, to stop doing things because it's what's expected of us by society until we're really willing to figure out what we were, what our purpose is um, and how we can gain the skills that we need to take the purpose that we've been given 
and gain the skills to impact the lives of other people in a way that gives us fulfillment and positively impacts others around us, then you're always going to be searching for something. And so this idea of here's step one, step two, step three, step four, and step five is your fulfilling life. You got there. You did it. That doesn't exist. And anybody that thinks it does is going to be in my position in 2016 where you are heartbroken and crashing because you just spent the first 30 years of your life um, chasing something that doesn't exist. And so the sooner that somebody can step back and just get real with what they want so that they can start figuring out how to accomplish it, the sooner they'll be able to impact the world in the way that they're meant to. That is beautiful. <laughs> um, I really need to go listen to your podcast. I, I haven't done it yet, but let's see, is it, this is week two for you or week one? Yeah. So I have, I launched on August 3rd and I just, um, today was my fifth episode, my fifth episode okay. launched. So, okay. Um, I'll listen to your, your Brene Brown review for sure. And uh, we'll chit chat about you phasing in your 75 heart in the, uh, yes. maybe every time you phase something in, I'll watch one of the TED talks. Hey, <laughs> I'm down with that. So um, beware that um, this podcasting thing is new. And so I'm, I'm working around with some audio and the Brene Brown talk um, podcast, the audio did not come out exactly the way I wanted. So don't let it discourage you from listening. Um, it's not quite the quality I would want it to be, but it's such an important message that I posted it anyways. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I'm, I'm that way with my YouTube show. Clearly I'm sitting out here in the sun and like half the time I've had sun glare on me. I have no idea how the audio is going to turn out, but, um, you know, I always tell my students to go outside and I like to work outside as much as I can. So here yeah, I, I like it. And I really hope that the birds I hear in the background make it in the podcast because they, <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> um, that's so funny. I couldn't really hear them at all. Yeah. They're great here, especially because I'm in Vegas. We don't really hear birds in the summertime because they're off trying not to melt. Yeah. Um, so it's a nice change. I can picture myself in your nice kind of cool green life instead of my <laughs> desert. As you say, cool. And it's like 90 degrees. Actually, yeah, we're at 80 now, but we're at 110. So, yeah. so 90 is cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amber, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to post a link to your um, podcast when I upload this to YouTube. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed um, talking to you and hopefully I gave your audience something that resonates with them. I think you did. Thanks. For me, at least. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Thank you. Bye.